welcome everyone. Um, everyone here in the exhibit hall, if you could get, if you're here and you'd like to hear a fascinating FAA interview, please head on over here to booth 3909 uh, Flight Now Express. We are, we are here, Nest Gen Express. We're here with Kevin Morris. He is the FAA drone guy. And, and that's just really fun um, because we don't get to talk to the FAA that often. That's not true. We get to talk to them all the time. They are so involved in what we're doing. And I'm just honored to be here to ask some questions and be here live with you guys here. This is going to be a lot of fun. So if you're ready to get going, let's do this. Hey, let's do this. We're at day one of Exponential. I'm more than happy. This is going to be a great conversation. This is going to be a good time. All right, let's see. Let's get this going. Let's, let's right. see. I got, I got a couple of good questions. Okay, so with drones becoming more autonomous, will we see an increase in rogue sky pirates stealing our Amazon packages? And will that will at least be cooler than the seafaring version. So if I had a crystal ball, that might be able to tell me, but one of the things you do when you get hired at the FAA, they take away your crystal ball. So I certainly can't forecast, are there gonna be issues with, uh, I don't wanna say air piracy, because that means something very, very different than the FAA, but uh, let's just term it security. How, how, do, how do we keep everything secure? And that's definitely some of the things that we're looking at. So you look at some of the, the work that the FAA has done, not only just in terms of the technological aspects, we have remote ID, which I know we're going to talk about. Uh, that's coming up here very shortly. But we also do a lot of work with our local law enforcement agencies. Uh, we, we fully recognize at the FAA that we don't have a, a safety inspector standing on every driveway monitoring everything that's happening. You know, just like law enforcement can have a police officer in every quarter. But with working with our law enforcement partners through our law enforcement assistance program, we have established a very solid line of communication with those agencies so that we can deal with these instances of illegal drone operations. How, what, what do we want the police to do if there's an illegal drone operation? How do police want us to help them investigate that? So all this type of communication goes on to maybe perhaps stop the pirate in the sky, if you will, stealing your hands on to every guard. Yeah. Uh, but that, that, you know, s safety and security is something that's always at the forefront of everything that we do. Absolutely. Now, I, I couldn't agree that more. So I'm also an FAA safety team drone pro. And we go around and we, we, we love extolling the virtues of everything that's happening within the drone industry from the FAA perspective. So absolutely, it, I'm also just love working with the FAA. It's a lot of fun. So question number two. So some critics, there may be some critics here at this conference. Maybe not. We're I can't, I can't love this here. No, There's no critics at the FAA here. Um, weird crystal ball question. Um, so... They've argued that the current regulatory framework is too rigid and inflexible to keep pace with the rapid development of drone box solutions, BV loss, and some of the more innovative uh, out there technology that is becoming more to the forefront of this industry. How do you respond to this criticism? Sure, I, well, I think it's a, it's a fair criticism, criticism to say that um, as a regulatory agency, it's challenging for us to keep up with the pace of innovation that we see in the drone world. Um, we're, we're an agency that's built on traditional aircraft, and it, you do not see that type of evolution of traditional aircraft and at the pace you see in sure. drones. I mean, here we are at X, uh, AVSI's Exponential. Uh, you've probably been a few times. I've been a few times. Just what you see on the floor here is nowhere what we saw a few years ago. So it's, it's crazy. So the challenge to us, and, and it's a fair criticism in that it's a challenge for the FAA to keep up. Um, one of the things I think that you see we do a lot more of now is collaboration with the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, folks like yourself with our drone pro program, and not only that, but when we look at regulation. So, for example, BB loss. That's the big topic conversation lately. When are we going to get beyond visual line of sight operations? We formed that BB loss uh, aviation rulemaking committee not too long ago, which is a huge partnership between the FAA and industry to come up with, okay, how do we all see this working? And then we put that into a final report, which is issued just about a year ago. And we take that into consideration when we start the rulemaking process. Now, I'm not saying we've started rulemaking process. You can't quote me on that. I like my job. I do want to work tomorrow morning. Uh, but when we do any rulemaking, we base that off of a lot of aviation rulemaking committees, which is to say we value industry's input. So they tell us what's not working. They tell us how they like to see it work. And then we look at incorporating that. It's important to remember when we're talking about keeping up with industry, the United States airspace system, it's the most complex on the entire planet. It's also the safest on the entire planet. I was in a, 
uh, panel session the other day, and I, I asked, well, how many people flew here to Denver? And you can imagine 70, 75% of the people raised their hand. I said, how many were afraid that they wouldn't make it? And, and nobody raised their hand. Well, there was one guy next to me because his flight was delayed, but that didn't really count. <laughs> but nobody raised their hand. Um, that's a testament to that legacy of how things work. The reason you hop on an airplane and the only thing you're really concerned about is what movies they have to show kind of. is because of the collaboration between industry and the FAA to make it safe. So when we look at drones, what they're capable of doing, we want to enable that type of operation. We realize, going back to BB loss, Part 107 prohibits it unless you have a waiver. That's not a scalable, repeatable right. way to, right? So no. we, we, we get that piece of it. So the, the trick is making it work in that complex airspace system that we have. I think it's all fair. And thank you for responding to the criticism that way. It, I think they, that they don't completely realize that everyone, all the listeners, they don't completely realize that just how much of a challenge it really is here in the U.S. national airspace system. So going outside of the U.S. just for a second, so how does the FAA work with other international aviation regulatory bodies to ensure that, and, and I would like your, your thoughts on this, to ensure that there's a consistent and standardized approach to, regula to regulating specifically uh, charter box solutions, BB loss aircraft, and other autonomous aircraft? Right. So if this almost goes back to some of the criticism that we hear, right? You, you hear of operations uh, in Africa, Rwanda, zipline, things like that, that are doing this. And people look and say, well, why are we doing this? We should be doing this. And we agree, we should be doing this here. But the challenge is significantly different for, for a lot of different reasons. Part of that challenge we feel we can overcome by regularly meeting with other regulators from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, for even to our neighbors to the north in Canada, south in Mexico, to make sure that, relatively speaking, because, again, we're all a little bit different in how we manage our airspace, um, how we can do this together so that something that is authorized, let's say, to operate in Europe would have to follow a very similar process to be authorized to operate here in the United States. Um, I can show you that it's, it's worked in the past. We have uh, foreign air carriers that fly into the U.S. all the time. Um, the safety standards that they have to maintain are the same as the safety standards we expect our carriers to maintain. So when they're flying into our country, that's a result of that collaboration with our uh, international partners to make sure that not only are you comfortable with us coming into your country with our aircraft based on our safety standards, but you could come into our country based on yours. Well, we're gonna follow that same process more or less for drones to make sure that what you're capable of doing here, whether it's a drone in the box or whether something's happening uh, in Rwanda, for example, with drones, that that will scale to Europe, it can scale to Canada, it can scale to the US. And as you can imagine, it takes a lot of work, a lot of meetings, and a lot of talking, but it's something that the FAA has excelled at in the past, and I would expect us to continue. So a serious question. Um, so with drones, obviously, I mean, this is a massive conference. We, we're here with 8,000 of our friends here, and so this is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, with, oh, uh oh, there we go, Ooh, almost <laughs> lost my question. <laughs> Good thing I memorized. Oh, interview's over. Oh, interview's over. No, no, no. Oh, stay right. here. <laughs> this is a very important question that everyone wants to know. So, will we see an increase in aerial paparazzi hovering outside of our windows, especially especially mine, obviously? And can we train our cats to take them down? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with the second half of your question. Can you ever train a cat to do anything? I suppose. I think it's pretty highly debatable. I don't know. I've had cats. Uh, they train you. I think that's how they work out. Uh, but uh, to the first part of your question, uh, really, we're getting into is privacy. Right. Yeah. How are we going to manage privacy? Um, I, I, from the FAA's perspective, privacy is not something we're charged with enforcement. Oh, right. So we, we're here for the certification, the regulation, the safety, efficiency of the airspace. Uh, but again, that goes down to a public perception thing as well. Mm. Um, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, I, I believe they might have been from uh, Drone Up, but we we're talking about the perception of drones are, for a lot of folks, still, they're flying above my backyard, they're spying on me, they're looking in my window, type of thing, right up until the point where they order something online and it's dropped off in their driveway in 10 minutes. That then drones become the greatest thing since sliced bread. So at, how, do we, how do we bridge that gap, right? How do, how do we get people very, very comfortable with drones so they stop seeing it as a why is this thing flying to, oh, hey, cool, look, an airplane, right? That's, that's the challenge. So what we do in terms of working with drone pros like yourself, uh, who go out to the community to try to help educate folks that, you know what, these are evil devices. These are devices that are changing the future of aviation. 
and it's really, really exciting. I, I made a, a comparison the other day. Um, I love the show Hamilton, the Broadway show Hamilton. Yeah. Fantastic show. One of the songs talk about how lucky we are to be alive right now. I feel the same way with drones and a, a how lucky we are to be alive at a time right now where we're seeing the advent of a completely new era of aviation that we all collectively will shape. It's pretty exciting. Nice. It reminds me of a song, Aladdin. The whole new world. Yeah, see? see, it is karaoke. You didn't even know we were going to do that. Okay, so, so the final question, and this is on the, the topic of challenges. So what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the FAA in terms of regulating autonomous aircraft? And how do you plan to address these challenges in years to come? Right. So uh, one of the things I let people know is despite what folks might think, we don't wake up in the morning dreaming of new rules to make. That's not what motivates us. <laughs> that's Are you not, sure? Yeah, that's not what gets me up in the morning. It doesn't keep me up at night. In fact, most people I've talked to that have been involved with room making are like, it's, it's a process. Avoid it. Don't try. Don't get pulled into the team. Right. Uh, but there we have really brilliant, intelligent people at the FAA that work on rule making and things like that. So what, what I think of is, is one of the challenges is how do we enable what we're seeing without overburdening with regulations? And one of the key components of that is the collaborative safety effort. Okay. So somebody had asked me earlier at the conference, you know, what, what's, the, what's, what's my dream aspiration for what we see in the drone community? My answer to that was a safety culture. All right, so you, you look at traditional aircraft, traditional aviation, been around over 100 years now at this point. There is a safety culture that's woven into everything every pilot does from the pilot who's got his own airplane on his farm to the commercial airline pilot that brought most people here that that safety culture is woven in so my challenge seems to be how do we embed that safety culture into the drone community we have a lot of brilliant people in the industry flying drones and they're very interested in the safety because they get it they understand if we don't do this safely it's never going to go anywhere because Unsafe acts require more regulation, right? We see that. Uh, so how do we reach the unreachables? How do we find people that maybe don't know that this podcast exists or True. that the FAA has social media channels or even a website for that matter? So if the challenge is reaching out to those pockets of the community, establishing relationships with folks like yourself to help carry that safety message and build that safety culture. That is ridiculously important. And, and I do see that as a challenge. Right. I mean, you have people now that are, they, they will go online. I mean, there's over 300,000 commercial drone pilots. Safety isn't really part of the test. Not really. Not at, the, not at the level where it needs to be. But even if so, passing a 60 question test, going to Best Buy or Costco and getting a drone and registering it for $5 doesn't make you a drone pro. It doesn't make you a safety professional. And so I would argue that you're absolutely correct. That is a huge challenge. How do we make that a reality? So, Kevin, thank you so, so much for being on the show today. This yeah. has been a true pleasure. Yeah, pleasure is all mine. This has been a great conversation. Good. I think it's been different. I love it. So this has been a highlight of my day work. Fantastic. Well, you hear it here, folks. Uh, uh, they wake up every morning trying to think of new rules. Not true. That's not true. They do believe that uh, they do believe that cats can be used to potentially take down drones, but they're also, they can tra they're training us. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is Next Gen Express, and we will catch you on the next episode. Bye now.